the meeting to order. I apologize if you get some feedback. I'm in a car. I'll be back at a uh, computer in about five minutes. Um, but let's call the meeting to order at 4.34 p.m. And welcome to the uh, Thursday, April 21st, 2022 meeting of the Council on Developmental Services for the state of Connecticut. Just a reminder to everyone attending the meeting that this is being recorded under Public Act 21-2. Uh, so therefore, when you uh, address the council or wish to speak, please state your name so that it's there for the record as uh, folks will maybe listening to this as an audio version down the road. So welcome everyone. First item on our agenda is uh, a moment of silence for individuals affected by COVID-19, please. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is the opportunity for public participation. Would any members of the public wish to address the council? Once again, please just state your name and then also you have three minutes to address the council. Would anyone like to speak? I see Donna C raising her hand. Please uh, mute yourself and welcome. Joe, can you help her unmute, please? Um, unfortunately, I don't have the ability to unmute somebody, but Donna, if, if you see a microphone symbol on your screen, you are more than welcome to. Sorry if you don't see it. You see it? It's not there. She may have to click on the upper right hand corner. I, th I think she's saying she's all right. She seemed to give confirmation. So Kevin, I think we might be OK to see if there are other folks uh, from the public who would like to speak. OK, we'll move on and uh, Donna, Donna, if you do unmute yourself, please feel free to do so, but we'll move on. Any other members of the public wish to address the council? All right, I do want to welcome uh, Kelly Dorsey to the meeting. Uh, she has submitted an application to be a uh, representative uh, for self-advocacy on the council, so welcome Kelly. You have not been officially uh, nominated yet, but just wanted to uh, let the council member know that she is with us today. So welcome. Any other members of the uh, um, any members of the public wish to address the council? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to our items on the agenda. So next item on the agenda is review and approval of the council minutes from March 17, 2022. You should have received them via email. Are there any additions, uh, direct, uh, any additions, uh, corrections to the minutes, or can we have a motion to approve the minutes as presented? Rick Lenz, uh, Council Member uh, Joe, did you get my edits that I emailed you? I did indeed, and I'll share my screen uh, so the council can see what you had suggested. Um, so as you can see here. Um, you there was um it was all in page two i believe um you had noted that um when karen levesque had uh, spoke um you said that the sentence had just trailed off um my suggestion is just to remove the word than so that the sentence reads in full uh perhaps postcards of upcoming events and services might be helpful because it is less costly so i'll i, I my suggestion there would just be to, to remove the word than um and then the the second comment that Rick had was uh, Kevin Bronson's comment, which I think Rick said uh, didn't wasn't very clear. Um, but Kevin said we are trying to focus on streamlining communications uh, and to avoid multiple handoffs of news and important updates before reaching families. Um, I, I think I understand um, that. However, I am totally open to suggestions of how that should be uh, reworded. OK, does anyone have any other additions or cor corrections? And I, I apologize, do. I can't see everyone on the screen, so. This is Patty. Go ahead, Patty. This is Kevin Zingler. Under um, ombudsman, ombud I'm going to say this, ombudsman report, um, the first sentence, that one kind of drops off too. It probably should have said to produce um, that month's report or something like that. 
the ombuds okay. person had a conflict and is unable to attend due to a RAC meeting and regrettably was unable to produce. Uh, Thank you. If I may, I did produce a report. I just didn't meet with the council. So what should we do with that? Did just to, uh, present, I, to present a report. OK, to present. OK, I was unable to present the report to the council. It was shared Very with him ahead of ahead of the meeting, if I recall. Yep, correct. OK, thank you. Uh, and I sent a couple of uh, changes into Joe as well a couple of hours ago. Uh, um, um, both dealing with the uh, last item that was discussed, which is the topic of investigations. I did want to note that uh, I did support uh, Adrian's suggestion that we have the discussion and that it would be uh, led by the uh, laborers of the council. Okay, other additions, corrections to the minutes? I just noticed, uh, Rick Lenz again, I just noticed another one on page two that I didn't communicate to Joe under the ombudsman report. She was regrettably unable to produce, I guess, a report. But she was able to produce a report, Rick. It, it, it was. I think she was unable to pre present it. She was. She was unable to to discuss it at the council meeting. And I think Correct. I've made. I, I've made a revision to to that. I'll, I'll, and for the benefit of the council, I'll just read that off right now. Um, and the sentence now reads: The ombuds person had a conflict and is unable to attend. Uh, due to a RAC meeting and regrettably was in, unable to present during the council meeting. Right. Perfect. Any other additions or corrections to the minutes? Hearing or seeing none, is there a motion to approve the minutes as amended? So moved, Karen Levesque. Is there a second by the council? Second, Rick Lenz. All right. Any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, I'll call a vote. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Chair votes aye and it passes unanimously. Thank you. And thank you, Joe, for your work on that. Uh, moving on, next item on our agenda is the Ombuds Persons Report. Welcome, Shannon. Uh, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. How's everybody doing tonight? Good. Good. Um, I sent the report out to everybody earlier this week, and you know, I I think what I would prefer to do at the meetings, if the council is in favor of this, is to send the report out and to use the time that we have to discuss uh, different items on the report that people have questions about, they want clarification about, that they're interested in. Um, Rick Lenz did ask me to answer a few questions after I sent the report out, so I'd like to um, to do that. And then if we have a little time, um, maybe we can kind of go over some of the areas of concern on the report, um, because I feel that those are probably you know, areas that I would like the council to be aware of um, even more so than, you know, the sort of individual issues, although a lot of the areas of concern come from dealing with those individual issues. So Chris, um, uh, Rick's question was for item number eight, um, supporting an individual and family who received a 30 day notice from a provider. Um, Rick wanted to know, um, you know, was it the same provider that was involved? Um, uh, what grounds did the provider have and what kind of support did I give? So there were two separate situations. Um, one is an ongoing issue where a family uh, got a 30 day notice from a DDS qualified provider a couple of months ago. Um, and I've remained involved in that situation um, with the family and working with the region um, to ensure that um, the uh, individual involved uh, continues to get the supports that they need um, through the transition period. Um, the region uh, recommended in that case a mediation. Um, a, a judge uh, who had been a former probate judge 
um, came and, and attempted to do a mediation between the provider and the family. But unfortunately, um, it really didn't lead to, um, I think, the provider uh, essentially changing their mind about working with the family. And so at this point, um, you know, I just maintain regular contact with the family and I follow their lead. If there's something that's happening um, uh, that uh, is problematic, then I will work with the family in the region um, and then the region deals with the provider on that. So um, that's one issue. Another issue came to me the other day where a case manager reached out to me because there's um, an individual that the department um, serves who lives in a group home who receives medication management from um, Clifford Beers. And um, I, I haven't been able to verify this myself yet, um, but the, um, the mother of this individual was told that Clifford Beers was uh, no longer, gave a 30 day notice and was no longer gonna provide medication management because they had made a decision not to um, serve people who live in group homes because there have been issues with people coming to appointments. Um, in this case, the individual has a brother who also who lives at home who also receives medication management and they're going to continue to serve that person. So the case manager reached out um, to talk to me and to ask my opinion on how to address this um, and how to follow up. And so um, you know, uh, we came up with a plan for her to reach out to number one, verify if this is actually something that's happening. Um, and uh, and number two, to, you know, to to let Clifford Beers know that we think that this is a violation of the individual's rights that, you know, uh, where a person lives shouldn't be a determination on where um, they receive supports. It occurred to me when I was thinking about talking to all of you about this, that it's also something that I feel if we verify that the agency is um, taking this action that I think we're going to need, I'm, I'm going to need to reach out to um, the regional directors um, to talk to them about this too, because I, I think it's going to be an issue for more than just that one person um, and it's problematic. So, um, so does that answer your question, Rick, or does anybody have any other questions about that? It does. Oh. Thank you. Um, the other question Rick has was um, for the areas con of concern at the end of the report. Um, the third um, bullet point is maintaining active family involvement, advocacy and support for individuals who receive residential supports outside the family home through DDS or private providers. Um, the reason that I brought this up is that, um, well, there's two reasons. One is that um, I'm dealing with several issues where there are parents who are not guardians um, for individuals who either live in a DDS group home or uh, are served by private providers. And um, I mean, those of you that know me obviously know that I think family advocacy is um, very important. <laughs> Um, and ongoing advocacy when a person's loved one is, um, you know, whether they're living with you at home or um, they're receiving supports from a provider, I think is critical to making sure that um, your loved one gets the supports that they need and that the supports that they get are based on what their needs are. Um, when a parent is not a guardian, and, you know, there's usually reasons for that. Um, the role of that parent in an individual's life is less clear, um, but it's my feeling that as long as there's not a good reason, and there might be a good reason um, for that parent not to be involved in that person's life anymore, then they're still that person's parent, and they're still somebody who should be involved and engaged in their life. Um, as long as the individual wants that. Um, and I, I feel like um, uh, protecting that um, family involvement is something that's a priority for me. Um, and it's just, it's something that I've worked on. You know, I, I, I think the other sort of piece of that is that I saw this at the ARC and I'm seeing it as an ombudsperson is that there are some providers that, um, 
uh, welcome family involvement and collaborate with families and see families as partners. And there are providers who don't. And um, there are providers who I have seen push back pretty hard um, when families have been advocating for their loved ones in a way that does not seem uh, inappropriate or in any way out of the realm. I mean, for people who are really just asking for their loved one to have the supports they need based on their individual needs. And so I think it's something that I'm aware of. It's something I've talked to the commissioner about. Um, I think that there needs to be some accountability when providers push back when families are being good advocates, um, because I think we are all supposed to be partners in making sure that every individual gets the supports that they need. So that's why I raised um, that in a few different ways in my areas of concern, and I, I've had several discussions with the commissioner about that as well. Does anybody have any other questions or were there any other, um, you know, uh, anything that you want to bring to my attention? I see Adrian. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you I'm glad brought, you that, brought up. that up. I've, I've, um, uh, I've been hearing, hearing about, about parents, parents who have a lot of pushback. I feel like there's an echo. I don't know if that's other people hear it, but. Um, and I, I, I've met quite a few families that are having trouble with the agencies. And, and I always know there's two sides to the story and our family, everything's complicated. So I'm not saying the agency's always wrong and the family's always right, who knows? But definitely there, it, it's hard to get accountability when there is a problem. Um, and you did put accountability as one, of the, as one of the areas of concern. And obviously that's a really important word, but it's also sort of vague in our world of, um, how things are managed and what do you do if you do run into a brick wall. Um, I'm glad that they can call you now. So that's one thing for sure. Um, and um, I think you really have your fingers on the pulse of a lot of really important issues. So I'm grateful for that. Thank you, that's Adrian. All. And um, no, thank you. And and I hope that, you know, please send families my way. I want to know about yeah. this stuff because I, I feel that, um, you know, I feel it's an important thing for me to be dealing with, but I also think it's an important thing for the council to be aware of and to be, you know, working with, um, with the agency on. Um, I, I, you know, I think it's a it's something that we should all be aware of and we should all be conscious of and we should all put in the forefront of our discussions. I see Rick has his hand up. Rick Rothstein. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Shannon. Um, yes, I'm giving your name out frequently and phone number and email. Um, it would seem that what we need is an educational process, both for providers and for families when they enter into their arrangement with with the department that uh, this isn't like drop the kid off and your loved one off and see you in 20 years uh, that uh, you are expected and uh, to continue to be involved and advocate. Uh, let, let the provider and the department know what, what how things are going, uh, what your loved one may need, and uh, how things can be better. And uh, those providers who are not family centered um, uh, ought to be uh, re-educated as well. Uh, fortunately, the providers we have on this council are very family centered, so uh, I think we have two good ones in Kevin and Pam. So. Um, here and uh, I'm sure Kevin tries to, uh, they both try to uh, uh, pass that word along in their provider meetings. Yeah, so. and I think it's it's important for us to try to educate families too that when you're choosing a provider, you're really choosing a partner. And, you know, if, um, you know, and, and it does, it, it does go both ways, you know, I mean, I think there are times sometimes when families are asking providers to do things that they can't do or that, you know, they're not willing to do. And often families look to DDS to try to force them to do something, and that's not really possible either. And so I know as the ombuds person and in my role at the ARC, you know, a lot of times what I count when families came to me with issues, 
you know, I, I would let them know, you know, you really need to develop a relationship with your provider because everything, you know, having people at odds all the time does nothing to help the individual who needs supports. And, you know, DDS can't really force providers to do a lot other than to adhere to, you know, the requirements that they have. Um, you're dealing with a private agency. And so it's important to shop around and it's important to have those discussions up front, I think, with providers about um, how open they are to you remaining involved in your loved one's life in a significant way. <laughs> Is there anything else? Are you all comfortable with? Oh, I see Christine. <laughs> Hold on. Sorry, I'm having trouble with teams today. Christine Haynes or Strauss. Um, I just was curious, you had, I think it was two or three at the top of the uh, listing of people that you were helping with less traditional housing. I'm just curious, what are those creative options? Well, that's something that um, I'm trying to explore with the family and with DDS and with a support broker. Um, you know, so I'm sure most of you have heard family say, you know, I can afford to buy a place, but I can't get the supports. And so I think that, um, you know, uh, a family was uh, came to me who, you know, was on a family thread and who was on the waiting list and, you know, said, what does it mean? What does it mean to be urgent? And am I ever going to get the group home and whatever? And I think this family expressed that they were open um, to looking at other options. They were a family that had some resources. And so, um, and they, you know, uh, were referred to me by the ARC. And so, you know, what I did was sort of facilitate a discussion between the family and a support broker that I know who's also a parent. Um, to see, you know, if the family was willing to look at other options, and then we pulled DDS into the discussion. This family actually doesn't have any um, uh, DDS residential funding. They have all community first choice funding. So it'll be interesting to see where we end up, but I'm committed to um, when people come my way and, um, you know, to try to see if we can navigate a path um, so that if someone's willing, and they're willing to work with the funding they have to try to figure something out, pulling in resources from other places, not just DDS, then I'm committed to trying to help people um, with that process. So this may be a question not for you, but for Jordan, I don't know. But does CFC funding, and you're, if you're on the urgent list, does that keep you from progressing because you are supposedly getting assistance, even if you can't find someone to hire? <laughs> No. This is Kevin Zingler. Any other questions for Shannon as the unbuds person? All right, seeing none. Thank you, uh, Shannon, for your report. And uh, I think we like this. Uh, I don't hear any other feedback in terms of the format you suggested, so why don't we try that for next month? And uh, I think that'll be more productive in terms of using our time with you so that we can um, dig into some of the issues on a case-by-case -case basis as needed. So thank you. Moving on our agenda, next item is our commissioner's report. Welcome, Commissioner Chef. Jordan Chef, and I should have said that when I said the word no. Um, so good afternoon, um, happy almost Earth Day. Uh, uh, and uh, so I'll just pick up uh, on on that point. The the determination around whether someone uh, is now uh, an emergency um, is not a means tested thing. It's it's circumstantial based on uh, health and safety, uh, health of the individuals in the house, um, and, and a number of other factors. Uh, many of the people who we make emergencies um, already have some residential funding through us, or have a combination of. Uh, residential funding, uh, CFC, CNA, um, home health care, they, they may have a combination or a suite of supports already, but the situation is no longer tenable. 
uh, and we make the determination that the situation's an emergency and look for a more comprehensive uh, placement setting. So that was the the, uh, the extended version of my no. Um, but uh, so I just wanted to share that. Um, I also just want to note, I, I, uh, Shannon and I talk uh, quite often, um, we, and uh, communication strategies on some of the issues uh, that she's encountering are, are one of the things that we took up this in this uh, in the conversations. We had two conversations this week about it, uh, and how she might be helpful uh, in communicating to families both the fact that there are more options than group homes and and things they may not know about because they haven't really um, come into the system, but also uh, rules of you know how we help providers come along. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm careful. I think there are a lot of providers that are very family centric. I think there are some that are not. Um, or I also think that it can be on a within an agency. It can be on a house by house or a program by program basis. Um, uh, some of you on the council have been on it long enough to hear me say that uh, a home is only as strong as its manager. Um, and the culture is often determined by the group home manager. Um, despite how an executive may lead, unless they can spend a lot of time at that house instilling the culture to the direct care staff, um, it really is a result. And, you know, even in, I think um, for those of you served in public, I think you can attest uh, probably to the same. Uh, the, the supervisor has a lot to do with the satisfaction of supports uh, and the and the, the, the way in which families receive. But uh, having said that, um, we're, we, we met and we broadened the circle beyond Shannon and I to include some other folks to talk about how we um, can help uh, with that messaging and, and we plan to do that. But I wanted to note, we do have a number of individuals we support who would prefer their family not be involved. Um, and uh, and that is their right, um, assuming that their uh, family is not the guardian um, or that they have no guardian, uh, they have a right to make those decisions without family. Uh, and so we, we, we have to be respectful of that uh, as well as we're doing that and, and build that into the education process. Um, and they may want family involvement, but not family decision making. Uh, and, and those are two very different things. So um, so we, we but I, I think that's the minority uh, of those we support uh, very much a smaller circle than than many, many of the people we support. But I just, you know, I, I try and stay away from those one size fits all type solutions and approaches because, you know, there's 17,000 plus people eligible and probably um, an equal number of individual stories that wouldn't look the same if you went and, and everyone had a chance to tell theirs. Um, one of the requests for me to touch on today was um, on the uh, ARPA funding. So uh, when we last met, we were poised to get some money out the door to providers, and we did in fact do that in late March. Um, it isn't until about a week ago that we got guidance out uh, on spending that money and how it would how it was to be apportioned uh, and they have that I would read you how it's apportioned but I'm going to sound like I'm just reading off a calculator for two or three minutes because it's a lot of percentages and dollars and decimal points and things and so I don't know that it's helpful it, it wouldn't be helpful for me to hear so I don't know if it's helpful for me to say uh, but the, we went over the ARPA spending in a previous meeting, and it, it, it's a cascaded across those same areas. Um, and I'll just tell you the areas of investment uh, that, that the funding uh, to providers was uh, distributed for. Uh, temporary provider stabilization funds, um, and these funds, uh, which in total for the system, doesn't give me, I don't have the total in front of me, um, r roughly represents a third of the payment providers received. Uh, it can be allocated towards overtime costs due to the pandemic, uh, time limited positions um, that were uh, brought on by agencies uh, and costs due to the pandemic, temp staffing, temp staffing agency costs, um, costs related to the implementation of EVV, um, staff increases to ensure retention, uh, increased administrative costs due to the pandemic and workforce shortage. So that was roughly a third um, of what will be three. There'll be three payments made to them. Um, and uh, that is the first of those three payments in that category. Um, the second area is the workforce stability, which has to do with hiring incentives. This is roughly um, a little more than a third. This is to help them in uh, uh, preparation uh, uh, for recurrent recruitment, staff hiring, staff retention and uh, staff referral incentives, any of those types of incentives. 
And the last major category, uh, which represents around 25% of the funding, 30% of the funding uh, that went out um, is uh, to be allocated towards uh, technology, uh, either purchased or leased that was used um, either during the pandemic uh, for assisting with communication or for uh, to modernize current business systems, um, uh, technology purchases for EVV, uh, software purchasing, licensing costs, IT consultants, and IT staff. Um, so th those are the three broad areas, and we met with um, a number of execs as members of the Alliance earlier this week to sort of debrief on that a little bit, and I'm sure that we'll have more provider follow-up. Uh, Scott McWilliams, who's our CFO, uh, Krista, whose name I'm not going to pronounce because I always get it wrong, Ostashevsky? Yeah, she's not here to correct me, so we'll go with that. Um, and uh, Nick Gerard, uh, one of our uh, staff that works um, in, a, in a number of areas, will be meeting, I'm sure, with the Alliance. Uh, so that, that's the update on the ARPA. Um, legislatively, um, I just wanted to share the, the, uh, the legislature's budget came out, as you're all aware. Uh, I believe that they've heard from a number of our private providers um, that there was some discontent about being left out of the 8% COLA they articulated for uh, many types of nonprofits, but excluded DD providers. Um, I believe there's been some discussion uh, there. Um, and I, you know where that lands, I'm not certain. Uh, it's important to note that while although the legislature put in 8%, um, there, the Secretary uh, of OPM, uh, Secretary Beckham, um, and I believe uh, in an, either in an interview or in a, some other uh, press release, uh, shared that there were concerns around um, spending cap and uh, and just the that 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 the things weren't in line and something would have to give. But this is as as you know, there's always a process after uh, the governor's budget comes out, the legislature puts out a budget, and then there. Uh, um, there's a lot of uh, discussion uh, that goes on, and I believe that's where we're at now. We should hopefully know a whole lot more when uh, session ends on or about May the 4th, I think. Um, and I'm not going to get, I'm going to ask Kevin to do the legislative update, so I don't want to get into the specific uh, legislative details, but I did want to just touch on the budget and some of the conversation uh, within the provider community uh, regarding that. Um, so the last thing I wanted to touch on from my report is uh, some of the TWRs, the temporary worker retirees. So people who retired as part of the wave, uh, the initial wave on um, uh, March 31st, April 1st, uh, some have come back and they some have come back in different capacities. Um, my former deputy commissioner, uh, Peter Mason, is back um, and he's going to be working for us, uh, helping us make sure that the ARPA money goes out and that it's spent uh, supporting providers, supporting the state in how we do that. Uh, and he'll have a couple of staff uh, that are on um, uh, short term uh, employment with us a year or two uh, to help us because it's a three year plan with the ARPA spending. Um, and there are some other retirees. Dr. Val Bagby Young is back uh, assisting us uh, while we recruit for replacement. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there were dozens and dozens of individuals who went that way. Not everyone uh, came back on a TWR either because we didn't need to or because uh, they weren't able, but um, given uh, the workforce crisis out there at all levels, uh, we have taken uh, the opportunity given to us by both the administration and, and the retired employees to bring them back uh, to assist us with agency stability. Um, and I think I'll, I'll stop there and see if folks have any questions for me today. And Rick Len's hand went up. I was just curious, uh, how long can the temporary workers come back for? Is that an open ended kind of situation? It is not open ended. They can work 120 days in a calendar year. So um, people who came back on or about uh, um, middle of April can work 120 days between now and December 31st. It's not a year from when they come back. It's the calendar. Um, so they have about 120 days. Uh, typically, um, the state has uh, asked uh, agencies, the, the administrations historically have asked agencies to not use a TWR for more than two stints. Stints, that's a hard word to say into a microphone, stints. Um, 
during the pandemic, there were a number of employees, uh, and even past the date of the emergency, to my knowledge, not necessarily at DDS, uh, where a third opportunity, a third tour uh, in retirement was made possible just because we needed uh, subject matter expertise in, in, in certain areas. So um, typically it's two um, tours at a maximum of 120 days each, both within a calendar, you know, two separate calendar years. And are they are they compensated at the level they were in their previous job, or is there a separate schedule? Uh, they're compensated based on the body of work uh, they're brought back to do. So Peter didn't come back as a deputy commissioner. Um, I, I don't know it, it, with him as an example. Um, I, I'm not sure, uh, and I don't I don't always get into those details. Typically, folks come back at a lower level. Um, there's uh, and I, I, typically folks come back at a lower level than they left at. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and obviously, there's no there's no further pension contribution and no uh, health care costs associated with bringing them back. So uh, there's a discount on salary and then a discount on benefits too by utilizing them that way. Uh, Adrian or Karen, I don't know whose hand went up first because I was looking at Rick. Um, well, I'll take the opportunity to go first, Karen Levesque. Um, I know you're aware that there was a closure of a nursing home and just in general terms, I'm wondering um, what is the oversight um, that the department provides um, for residents that um, are in nursing home care from our population and uh, how, how are they monitored? So um, thank you, Karen, for the question, Jordan Chef DDS. Um, I can't talk specifically, and I know you're not asking. I just want to make no. sure people know when I when I make the following statements, this is not specific to the incident uh, at that nursing home um, or or any specific nursing home. Uh, the department, so there is a there, there's a conditional intake to uh, nursing homes uh, that, that requires a, a doctor sign off. Um, typically from the individual's primary or from an attending or uh, uh, at a hospital if they're discharging uh, as a step down from a hospital setting to a nursing home. It may not go back through the primary. It may come straight from the hospital. Um, so uh, the, the individual needs to be qualified as meeting the medical necessity, the, has a medical necessity for that level of care uh, before being admitted there. Um, there's a federal process to ensure uh, people with uh, intellectual disability or other disabilities um, uh, are not institutionalized. And so anytime someone uh, who's flagged in our system is uh, having IDD, mental health, other physical disabilities, uh, or is suspected of having those issues, it triggers um, uh, the, the, the nursing home uh, would indicate, and it gets, I can't, we call it OBRA, uh, uh, and I don't remember what that acronym is for, uh, we use, used to use a system called Ascend, which was the software where we actually notify the federal government that that is the situation. Our nurses are then responsible for a 30-day, I believe it's a 30-day follow-up, uh, if the person is in fact in the nursing home for that 30 days. Uh, typically, our case managers know and do coordinated care between the nursing home. Uh, you know, they, they, they'll write notes, uh, they'll get updates. Uh, we often do visits, um, certainly outside of the pandemic, we did visits. During the pandemic, we weren't allowed in. Um, so there, there's a number of ways in which we're connected to that, but the nursing homes are uh, funded uh, through Medicaid uh, with oversight DSS in terms of the funding um, and licensed uh, uh, through the Department of Public Health. So our oversight is pretty minimal, um, but we do have contact and there is a system. If someone is in there, we do more than a 30 day uh, check uh, if um, the person's there longer, we continue those. Um, we have what we call them OBRIT nurses. Um, so uh, that, that's how we're connected to the process for when people are uh, placed in long-term care or skilled nursing facilities. Thank you for that information because I've been asked uh, quite frequently recently about that. So I think that will help clarify. Thank you. You're welcome. Adrian. Yeah. Hi, Adrian Benjamin. Um, so the ARPA funding, I'm a little, you know, this stuff is whether you talk percentages or whatever. My confusion is 
the amount of money that's going to go for workforce stability. Does that mean staff will be getting like a one time bonus or they'll be getting an overall raise weekly? Is this going to happen in the next few months and the next whatever? Because the boy, the demoralization level is profound. Yeah. And so um, I would love that them <laughs> something could happen. So we that we are um, we we are or will be we, we urge the the um, executive team at the alliance uh, we we're going to urge people to uh, spend the money that they just had put in their hand as quickly as possible knowing that additional the second round of funding will come after July first um, at the initial round of funding we um, are recommending and we in, in there's in the document that we shared with providers there are some you know sort of uh, scenarios or examples indicated but um we we would be looking potentially at them using it for a, a retro wage adjustment it, it can't be a permanent wage adjustment because this funding disappears at, at at some point so they can't build it necessarily into their base although we are raising the minimum wage and giving separate money from the arpa state funding uh and federal funding uh through medicaid um to drive wages up again uh july 1st but there is re retention incentives um, uh, that are in there. So, you know, money that can be given to staff uh, to entice them to stay on. Um, I think that they can if they they can be used as referral incentives if they're bringing friends into the fold. So there, I think there's a number of ways that the money can end up uh, in direct care's pocket uh, quickly. Um, and I, I, you know, it was it, it was a pretty good chunk of money. I, I can't remember the exact amount, but it was millions of dollars that we just put out to pro the providers, you know, 40, 50, 60 million dollars, something like that. Um, so it was a fair amount of money with a large portion of it being for those types of uh, incentives um, or, uh, you know, they could go back and for the period of the uh, portion of the pandemic, I think from three one last year, I don't have the date in front of me uh, through three thirty one this year, they could go back and do, you know, he, if you will, hero pay, where they could boost their pay. Uh, that way it goes out proportionally, you know, on numbers of hours worked during the pandemic. So there, there's a number of ways that that can go out, and we're hoping that it goes out pretty quickly. Does each, thank you, Adrian's again, does each agency decide themselves, or is there a DDS recommended way? Um, um, is there so, going to be anyone monitoring that the money actually gets into the hands of the workers and not into the hands of the CEOs? So the you know first I mean? thing I'll say is I know a lot of CEOs who work 70 and 80 hours a week uh, or through the pandemic and were okay. available 24-7. So if some of it ended up in a CEO's pocket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, well, but sure. the, 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 I just say it. Okay. Um, they, they are heroes, too. Um, and Ours I know that you weren't quit, speaking so disparagingly of, but the, with the, I just want to make sure. The, the emphasis on being on direct care, even. Uh, Jordan Shesta. Okay. Um, so uh, <laughs> Peter, Peter, that Peter came back to make sure that we're spending the ARPA money because there's a lot of strings with the federal funding that it gets spent right. So um, he, he's been back since Tuesday uh, um, since he retired, and he'll be assisting uh, as well as our op center um, where he used to roost before he was deputy commissioner, and and Scott McWilliams and Krista and Kevin uh, will all be part okay. of ensuring that we do that. And if they don't put it in the intended areas, it has to come back. That's what I, I was just wondering what the accountability process is. Yeah, so I, 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 I think that there will likely be some sort of uh, Excel schedule that they need to fill out, um, not on a staff by staff basis, but, you know, in, in broad mm -hmm. terms where they spent the money and a provider attestation, which is how we often, um, given the number of providers and the, and the over a billion dollars that we spend, we often rely on attestation and then we do a test on that. So they'll attest that they did it and our auditing department will sample a number of providers to make sure that the attestations are consistent um, with the financials, the financials. And so, yeah, nothing, nothing goes Sounds unaudited good. at multiple levels. Sounds good. I approve. <laughs> Excellent. Mr. Rothstein. Yes, um, I have two quick questions. Hopefully they're quick questions. Uh, the first one is uh, how is COVID going right now with uh, out in our in our with our folks out in the field uh, um, uh there has been a bump um uh, statewide but uh is that affecting our population uh, as well or uh, about the same as everyone else so 
uh, the, the state has stood down uh, some of its um, incident command protocols, uh, and we mirrored some of that, um, although we maintain a monthly phone call. Uh, I do get other updates. So, um, and given the rate at which I've watched the state percentage of positivity rise, um, I have been doing some outreach because the meeting isn't coming fast enough for me to get a real sense of the pulse. I do get the data weekly. There's been a very mild uptick of positive cases in, in terms of, I think I've shared with you the graph that I rely on on a weekly basis to see how we're doing yeah. uh, at some mm -hmm. point in the past uh, that our uh, business intelligence unit produces for me still. Um, so there's been a little bit, I did, it not reflected in the data that I saw Friday, I did hear of a handful of cases that I was worried was an outbreak. Um, I have a, I, I always have a much better sense uh, in real time what's going on in public than I might in the private sector just because the the supervisor of our public programs reports directly to me. Uh, mm -hmm. So we do have a couple more cases. Uh, they, they happen to be very mild. Uh, the individuals are able to isolate within their homes and it wasn't an outbreak. It was, uh, I think, five cases in public scattered across four settings. Um, so, you know, given we, we had five people in a cottage sometimes uh, and multiple cottages at the same time. So um, we're mindful of it. Um, so far, things have been mild, uh, and, and I hope that that continues. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a nervous Nelly around certain things, and this COVID stuff is certainly one of them. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm anxious. I, I, in, in my anxiousness, I have asked for clarification about the uh, rising positivity, um, and there's, uh, I'm, I'm told there's a couple of reasons for it, and the benchmark that um, a lot of the state leaders are looking at is no longer that positivity rate, but the hospitalization rate. Um, reasons for rising the positivity rate may be because people are going only for a PCR test if they're not getting a negative at home test. So if you're testing negative at home, you're not showing up for a PCR test. When you get a positive at home, you're showing up for a PCR test. So the number of people going to lab-based settings that are required to report to the state are often sicker uh, than the general population taking tests at home. And that's one of the reasons, if I understand correctly from the epidemiologists at DPH, that's one of the reasons you see an uptick in the number. Um, but the, if um, most of the incidences of positivity are mild uh, and not requiring hospitalization, then vaccines are doing what they're supposed to and we should, we should feel very comfortable and great about that. Um, I have seen, just anecdotally, I have seen some businesses where I live um, uh, on their own institute mask mandates that weren't there a month ago um, for whatever their reasons may be. Um, but I have not heard anything at the state level around that. Uh, and we continue to follow the federal guidance in our um, ICF settings uh, and in m many of our other settings. And our private providers are, are, have latitude. Uh, to implement uh, something more, they, they can't implement something less stringent than the state, but we have expressed that if they wish to institute something more stringent than the state, uh, they can. That has at times rankled uh, some family members who um, uh, uh, don't want to adhere still to uh, mask requirements or outdoor visits or things like that. Um, and there's some, you know, if you go to a different day provider than you do a residential provider, you may be getting two different messages from the providers because they may not be in sync. But I think largely um, our community remains cautious and concerned uh, and, and takes a lot of, of the appropriate necessary steps. So that's what I'm seeing, yeah. Rick. Yeah, well, um, I guess uh, my son was one of those who had a negative test at home, a negative rapid test, and then three days later, a positive PCR test. Uh, so he's having a second uh, extended um, isolation period. Uh, so um, um, there are those, as you mentioned, that uh, negative at home and positive at a PCR level. So um, uh, the, the uh, interesting data to look at if you're curious, like I am, uh, there's some, uh, I, I assume it occurs here in. Uh, Connecticut too. I do follow a lot of Massachusetts news because of my sports affinities. Mm -hmm. um, and Massachusetts publishes routinely some uh, wastewater sampling mm -hmm. and does some interesting work with it on their website. And I think what I read today uh, is their wastewater sampling, which usually is ahead of their PCR testing, has uh, doubled in positivity each week for the last three weeks. 
So I think they went from below two and they're now above eight in the or nine in the wastewater uh, uh, sampling that they're doing, which just is indicative of what's to come. Um, but I, I don't know about any wastewater in Connecticut. I know that we do test in several areas, but I don't have that at my fingertips. I just happened to read the article this morning following up on the Celtics win last night. Okay, thank you. And uh, the other question is, um, last month we had Dr. Ellis present, I think it was last month, and she did mention that a newsletter is going to start going out for uh, dealing with her area of equity and inclusion. And, um, you know, we have been waiting for a long time to have a newsletter for, for families and guardians. And uh, I was wondering if that uh, can also be put on, on, on a fast track to get back up again. It's been a long time. What to get what back up again? A newsletter for families in some form. So um, Kevin's here for a legislative update, but he's also our comms director. Yeah. and He has some visions around communication strategies and how we communicate with families. So um, I will let him share uh, where we're at with some of that. I don't. I, I just want to be clear. I don't think we will ever get back to a paper mailed <laughs> newsletter um, again. Um, so uh, uh, with that, we, we, there may be some things that we mail, but not a quarterly. I think I forget what we used to call it, Family Matters or something like that. There was a, a regular publication during the O'Meara administration that was disseminated. Um, yeah, direct to Families, I think it was. Called. Direct to Families. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Kevin, do you want to touch on communication strategies and where we're at? It is part of the five year plan is improving effective communications with uh, uh, families and other stakeholders. Sure, Kevin Bronson from uh, DDS. So we're in we're currently and the commissioner is correct. You know, I, I you know, a newsletter uh, in paper form won't happen anymore, but th you could theoretically think of, you know, our website you know, and updates to website as a newsletter, right? So what we're looking to do is uh, um, work on our website, right? Because it's the main way people uh, look at our agency uh, build. I think I've talked about this plenty of times, but we're actually in the process of um, working with uh, the, whatever the IT department at the state is called currently BITS, I believe it is. Um, it is called BITS. 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 I've had a, I've been, I'm young, generally speaking, right? And um, I've been at the state for 10 years and the agent, the IT agency has been four different names the 10 years I've been here. So um, just put that in perspective. But anyways, um, so we're working with them. They're actually, they have a research team, uh, kind of like our business analytics team, right? Where they're going to look through our website uh, figure out what the most used pages are, what the least used used pages are, um, and and we're going to be I interviewing families, um, individuals, uh, stakeholders, essentially, and and build that and basically rebuild our website to focus more on um, uh, families and individuals, right? And then and then uh, providers as well, but it's it's more focused on on the uh, the individual. Um, so and then build that email list or uh, build out an email list. So uh, whenever a division or commissioner or someone uh, along those lines has information to share, uh, they could share it out via the people that um, subscribed. Right. Um, and, and utilizing that kind of it's it's the same concept as a newsletter, right? Sending out information. Uh, period periodically, uh, but it, this is going to be more. You kind of sign up for what you're looking for, um, and then we'll we'll share it as it goes. So it's more, and that's kind of what I got in the last thing um, with the notes, which you guys were talking about. Is is what we're trying to do is avoid, uh, you know, the the old game of telephone, right? Where whisper into one person's ear, and the person at the other end doesn't hear the same thing, um, and that's kind of what happens now. And we're trying to fix that. So some more direct communication, I guess. It's a it's a long way to say more direct communication. Hopefully that answers um, your question. 
Yeah, that that does point us in the right direction. Um, it is the the telephone line is getting longer and longer. It seems right now. So, um, and anything we could move in that direction would be helpful. Um, so uh, we'll keep an eye on that, and I'm sure people here, including myself, would gladly volunteer to input to the uh, researchers. So. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for offering Kevin Bronson from DDS, by the way. Um, and this is Jordan Chef from DDS. If there aren't additional questions for me, I, I just wanted to cap my uh, report um, uh, by saying um, I, I really, I, I think it's obvious. I, I really appreciate uh, the work Shannon is doing within the organization. Earlier today, when she presented a report, um, she she was asked a question and responded directly. Uh, and indicated a specific agency. I just want to, for the record, since this is recorded and will be posted, uh, the agency that she mentioned by name is highly regarded, does quality work, and is an important and vital partner with us. Um, all agencies have uh, hiccups, or and as she said, there's always two sides to a story. So I just wanted to make sure. Um, we, I try not to, especially you know, with the, the way we're recorded with public record, not to uh, be too specific. Um, uh, other than when I'm talking about public, there's only one public. Um, but uh, I just wanted to say that. So just in case anyone goes back and, and watches this, um, uh, they will hear both uh, the potential uh, of something that didn't sound quite right, but also know that um, they're a qualified provider in good standing. Uh, they do good work and we appreciate and value them as a partner. And with that, uh, Mr. Zingler, I will uh, conclude my report unless there's other questions. Great, thank you, uh, Commissioner Chef. This is Kevin Zingler, uh, Chair of the Council. Uh, I don't see any further questions, so moving on our agenda, uh, we will go to our legislative update with Kevin Bronson. So welcome, Kevin. Uh, Kevin Bronson, I don't really have, from DDS, I don't really have too much of a legislative update just because the Commissioner kind of touched on a lot of the meat of it, um, which is generally speaking good, right? You know, when you don't have too much to talk about. We, as we all know, we have a very um, light legislative agenda this year. Uh, we, uh, the public health chairs reached out, um, I would say about last week. Uh, it, it, with the end of session every day, just feels like it's molding into one. So it might have not been last week. But, anyways, it was a couple, it was recent. Uh, the chairs reached out. We're combining all of five of our agency bills into one bill. Um, so if you're following our legislative package, you're going to be looking out for Senate Bill 369-369. And you'll find that there's a strike all amendment, um, which basically puts all of our all five of our bills into that one agency bill. Um, and there's a Republican amendment on it from Senator Whitkos, uh, specifically touching on uh, a section in the bill regarding uh, green energy at um, assessments by providers at houses and residents, um, and just making sure they're F they're not part of FOI, right? So, uh, you know, in information on the house uh, location, floor plans, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, people can't find. Um, so, and I think that, oh, and the only thing to mention um, that the commissioner didn't talk about in the budget was that the uh, IT, um, what they did was is in the, in the governor's recommended budget, they centralized uh, the department of bits. See, I'm doing this already again, uh, bits. Um, the Department of IT, they they took the people and they central they they took IT basically out of our agency and centralized the the positions, but they still worked in our agency. It's confusing, anyways. Um, the Appropriations Committee uh, pulled that out, so uh, they're suggesting that IT stays uh, within each agency. Uh, IT support. Um, and I think that's it. I don't know. Uh, Jordan Chef DDS, uh, not legislatively, but Kevin did drop in the chat. Not everyone monitors the chat. Uh, Yale does do wastewater testing uh, here 
and there's a website for it uh, that Joe can send out by email if you want to look at uh, the testing of uh, wastewater samples uh, for Connecticut. Now I know where to look for it right here at home. Thanks, Kevin. No problem. It, it's ironic. Uh, the I read a lot of news, and I believe if I'm I, I believe I'm right, but um, I think Yale started doing wastewater prior to it, and they just ironically noticed that there was you know they found COVID in the wastewater, and and then it all kind of came to fruition. So, but anyways, besides that. Any questions on uh, our legislative stuff? Let's see Adrian. Hello, thank you, Adrian Benjamin. Um, two questions. One is, well, it's actually one question. So the Alliance for Nonprofits had that proposal that four hundred sixty-one dollar million dollars be added to uh, the private all the private providers, not just DDS, private private nonprofits, to make up for the years of no funding and losses. Um, I don't think that's actually in a specific bill. Like there's no Senate bill for that, but has, and when I asked my state senator recently about that money and those issues, he said he believed that the Public Health Department of Appropriations did in, make a, a, a 6% increase. Um, do you know anything about that? And do I have that? Is this something we should still be advocating on? Because we yeah, all so talk they, about. If yeah. I can, Adrian Jordan, Chef DDS, the 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 four hundred fifty to five hundred million that uh, John Carl Casa from the Alliance had advocated for in his public statement isn't uh, a line item you'll see anywhere. I believe that uh, what I understand is uh, sent from Senator Austin, who chairs. Um, I don't know if she chairs appropriations anymore, but she's certainly ranking member. She does chair she's still. Co she, Tony she co -chair, she's co-chair with Tony. Um, yeah. That, that what I understand is indicated by her is that the eight uh, percent cola for nonprofits included in the appropriations budget is a first step towards a multi-year approach to getting to the number uh, the alliance had sought uh, because of a settlement uh, that Secretary McCaw. Uh, provided uh, based on the threat of strike last May, uh, they opted to not include DDS fully in in that 8% COLA. Uh, looking at the numbers from what we got last year and what has been proposed this year, uh, I think it nets out pretty evenly somewhere around 8% and 4% one year in reverse. So like we were 8% last year, 4% this year. And uh, although it's not articulated as 4% through the ARPA funding, I think they're looking at additional funds coming to those providers. But as I indicated earlier, that was the legislature's initial position. Uh, Secretary Beckham identified some uh, spending issues or uh, for the legislature in their proposed budget. Um, the response to him was that those were placeholders for further discussion as they knew they were going to negotiate and that those negotiations are going on now. Um, and whatever it is, um, uh, Whatever it is that the, the that they settle on, and of course we'll continue to advocate for the governor's uh, uh, side of the budget. Uh, but whatever it is they settle on will be, I think Senator Austin would consider a first step towards trying to fulfill uh, that request on behalf of the nonprofits. Does that help, Adrian? Sort of. Um, so if we were, I mean. We all every week we talk about or every month or every day we talk about the problem of low low pay for the staff, direct support staff. Is there something we should be doing as advocates to push on this? Call call who? Since there's no specific budget, I it's always easier when you've got Senate bill this, do this, please support this bill. But is there any specific thing we should be doing to help move this forward or, or consolidate it? I don't have a specific recommendation uh, on how you would advance the efforts of the legislature's priorities. Um, so uh, you could, um, I, I, I mean, I, I think it's always important to advocate. Diplomatic. And I don't really need to reference a super a specific bill. Um, I think that um, I, I think that you can make those calls to those people. I will tell you that they are, while they're still receiving phone calls, and that was referenced today on the floor during the CBAC testimony. Uh, that legislators were leaving the floor uh, to go take calls from constituents in support or against uh, the CBEC um, uh, approval. Uh, 
they are they they're they're locked in trying to get something done for um I, I, I think uh, uh, uh Representative Ritter was actually quoted as saying he needs something within he he needs some he needs some solid um agreement uh from the administration and the and both chambers within forty eight hours if if they're to meet their statutory deadline of May fourth. Um I think there was okay. an article uh today. So they they're they're working on it, but um I don't think it's ever too late for advocacy. All right, thank you. Uh, Rick Rostin, I believe, is next. Rick, you're muted. That was a legacy, and so I will pull that down. I think I'm set. Okay. Christine? Sorry, I don't know why meetings isn't working for me today. It's Christine Hainsworth Strauss. I have a question. This may not be in the legislative section, but it may be. Um, in recently talking with our US senators about raising the uh, limitation for Social Security assets, it was clear that they are, Senator Blumenthal is, I guess, co sponsoring this. It's gone through the House. We don't know what the number is going to end up being and getting rid of the mental, uh, marriage penalty. But I'm wondering, the thing that drives me crazy personally <laughs> is working with a $1,600 asset limitation for our state with the DSS. So how, why is that limit lower? This may not be able to be answered tonight, but why is that limit lower? And how can we get them to be the same number or similar numbers? or to let stop being such a difficult limitation to work around with people who already have so many limitations and the families to deal with it. Yeah, I, Kevin Bronson, I definitely will not be able to answer that tonight, but I <laughs> will, I can follow up with you and get you an answer afterwards. How about that? And, and it may be a consideration for a future guest, um, uh, Jordan Chef DDS. Uh, Krista used to attend these meetings when she was in Kevin's role. Uh, she now oversees our Medicaid ops unit um, and has a strong background with DSS. So she could not only tell you where things are at now within the state, uh, she'll understand a little bit of the history of it. Um, if someone, th there are some options uh, to, to have uh, uh, either certain income disregarded towards that asset limit or a higher asset limit. A program I think called SO5. If you have um, income that is driving your asset accrual, uh, that uh, you can have. Uh, so if, if your minimum, I don't know if it has to be minimum wage, but if it's because you're generating income, uh, there's a way to disregard some of that income or, or raise the asset level. Uh, but I, I'm out of my league a, a little bit. Um, was just trying to help. But um, and as to why things are different federally and state, I, I would defer to uh, Krista as well. I'm not I'm not prepared to answer that. But I yeah, I, I will get I'll get you an answer. I just know that I can't answer it now. So. <laughs> you got one more, Christine? Yes, Christine. Yes, Christine. It's not on anything. You're good. You're good. You're good. Oh, OK. Okay. Um, and now I probably muted. Did I mute? No, good. No, you're good. Okay. So um, my understanding is from the programs too, is that this is a temporary uh, asset limitation you can lift. But the real problem seems to be, from what I understand from talking to DSS originally, is something that maybe, you, you know, the two commissioners need to speak about or something needs to happen, where the DS, you can go off on this other tangent and come off of, your health care insurance. I was told this by a DSS person that you can come off uh, and go into the working disabled, but you then are in a different health group with Husky C and not protected by the ID as a typical DDS client. So it has to do with that. And so I don't think there's a permanent solution out there. And I think we need to look at one. So maybe that's something we could investigate. I, I think having Krista come and visit would be helpful to have that conversation. That would be my recommendation. 
because she would know all the answers to all those questions and understand every word you said. And I'm just going to smile and say, I have someone who does that really well. Because <laughs> I, I, then Kevin Bronson, DDS, I was probably just going to go back and play her the recording of your question and say, can you please answer this for me? <laughs> In all perfect. honesty, so. Then let me just Let's say have... hi, Krista. <laughs> Krista, come, come back. Now, now she's going to hear me mispronounce her name too, which is just horrible. But that's okay. Sorry. Any? All right. Anything else for me? Sorry. All right. Thank you, Kevin. This is Kevin Zingler, chair of the council. Oh, I, sorry. I Kevin Zing. Sorry, Kevin oh, Brown. One more time. I our bill. I should mention our bill is sitting in the Senate. We're hoping that the bill we were hoping the bill is going to run yesterday um my feeling is that it hopefully will run at the beginning of next week is my hope uh which then house and then signed by the governor so that that's we're just waiting everything's sitting there we're waiting had a conversation with uh the chair so we're it's just a matter of when they call it i didn't mean to interrupt but sorry now i'm done thank you that's important information thank you uh, once again, Kevin Zingler, Chair of the Council. So uh, our next item on our agenda, thank you for your report, Kevin, from DDS. Uh, next item on our agenda is investigations discussion. I believe uh, um, uh, Council Member uh, Adrian uh, Benjamin asked us to put this on uh, to talk about investigations, I guess, uh, uh, from a 50,000 foot level, I guess, about process. I, I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, Kevin, I, my understanding is that we might move to executive session uh, and allow the. Uh, that's what I thought we, that was going to happen is that you go to executive session I and discuss yes. the investigation process. I could be wrong. Um, okay. uh, if and and if that's the case, then we we would leave staff from their responsibilities here, uh, including myself, if I understand executive session correctly. If I'm understanding that incorrectly, uh, I can stick around for a little bit longer. But I I wasn't sure what the intent was. Um, just quickly, um, Joe Carvalho, uh, DDS, um, I, I believe in Rick Rothstein, please correct me if I'm wrong. I think you're, you're, I think the purpose of your email is to to say that this portion of the conversation wouldn't be under the commissioner's update and that this agenda item would just be led in discussion by a council member. Forgive me if I'm wrong. I just want to make sure I have that right. Uh, yes, that is correct. Um, I think uh, you know we could decide whether that should be executive session or not. Um, I think there's a lot to air out. Um, obviously, nothing is going to happen today uh, or next week, possibly not even till next year. And that's only if uh, uh, there's agreement that something needs to change. So um, um, I guess I will yield to the chair uh, to decide where we go from here. Okay, why don't we, uh, this is Kevin Zingler, Chair of the Council. Um, why don't we take it into executive session and uh, let's discuss what our objectives are and then we can, uh, at, a, at a further council meeting, figure out next steps. Does that work for everyone or do we want to do it? I so, see a couple of hands go up. Patty, I see your hand go up. Um, Patty Silva, um, Council Member, just if we do that, do we want to just um, take care of the topics for future council meetings first? Um, because we won't be coming back out of executive session to end the meeting probably, right? Correct, that would be my recommendation. Are there other questions or concerns or comments from council members before we uh, do that uh, process? I see Karen, you have your hand up. I'm not sure if it's a legacy and I see Christine has her hand no, up. No, it's not a legacy, Karen Levesque here. Um, I think we have to adjourn the public session. Um, we can take care of the item on the agenda, but I think we have to come out and adjourn in public session. But the right. other thing is, um, I agree that uh, because there might be um, identifying um, information given on individuals, I think the best choice would be to uh, conduct the next portion of the meeting and executive session. OK, so so if uh, if the council is uh, agreeable to this, uh, I don't see uh, any other hands up. 
Um, I will move on the agenda and we will circle back into executive session um, to uh, uh, discuss this item regarding investigations. Is that uh, the pleasure of the council? Is that OK? Agreeable by all members? Yeah, I see head shaking. Yes. I don't see anyone uh, disagreeing, so that's how we will proceed. Um, so let's go on to topics for future council meetings. Uh, we did have one suggestion uh, that through our discussion here about asking if Krista could give us an update uh, for DSS uh, uh, income limits. Uh, maybe she has, has some other updates, so maybe we can invite her to our next council meeting or to a future council meeting. Other topics that folks would like to um, discuss. I see Patty's hand. Yes, Patty Silva, council member. Um, you guys are probably aware that um, Bo Doherty, the president of Special Olympics Connecticut, is going to be retiring um, on August 29th. And I didn't know if it would be appropriate for the council to um, do something uh, to recognize his service. Um, so I just thought that could maybe be a topic sure. to talk about. Um, Forgive me, who, who whose service? I apologize, I missed the name. Bo, Bo Doherty, uh, the president of Special Olympics Connecticut. Thank you, Patty. Great suggestion, Patty. Thank you. Other other suggestions for topics? I didn't mean to cut you off, Patty, if you had more. Nope. Okay. Any other items that folks would like to uh, discuss? This is our opportunity to get things in place for our next meeting, which will be on May 19th at 4.30 p.m. I, I assume via Zoom, uh, via Teams at this point. All right, hearing none, I don't see any other um, hands raised. We will move on. So uh, at this time, we will, we will, I'm sorry? Sorry. Okay, that was just getting some feedback. So at, at this time, I would entertain a motion for the council to uh, sus well, actually suspend the rules to add an item to our agenda of executive session. But I see Kevin raising his hand, so maybe he has some advice for us on how to maneuver this. Yeah, Kevin Bronson, no, you, you're you right. I just want to make sure that um, you remember that uh, if you want to one of us staff to stay in you have to invite you know invite someone that's not in remember like that and then um also uh you have to time out remember the when yep. you go into executive session when you leave executive session and no then close the meeting. correct yep. so that's i just want to make that reminder and so, i don't know joe and i don't know if joe if and i don't know this answer or not i just want to make sure if dds staff doesn't stay on if the if the team's meeting terminates or not, but that would be. My my understanding is that the team's meeting um, recording stops as soon as the DDS staff leave the call. Um, I don't believe the the call itself terminates. Um, you know, forgive me, I, I I don't know for for sure, but that is my, that's my understanding. Um, um, and hey. I think. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kevin. And I was just saying, Kevin, again, and I just want to remind one more thing is that executive session, you have to take notes, but the notes aren't public. Or Correct. If you remember, so, and they don't have to be detailed, just generally. The council speaking. discussed this, yep. And then, and then just make sure that we have a time of when the actual, once you return to a public meeting, that we have a note of when that meeting concluded and who made the motion, um, et cetera. Thank you. Perfect. I will do that. Thank you. Um, I see Shannon Jacobino has her hand up. I don't know if she has some advice for the council or, or feedback. Uh, well, no, I'm I'm technically not a DDS employee, um, and I don't know if you want me to stay for this discussion or not. So um, I was just uh, clarifying that. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that feedback. Um, so I guess at this point, I, I see Adrian, you had your hand raised. Uh, I think it'd be good for Shannon to stay and see what's been going on. OK, does anyone uh, from the council have objections to having Shannon Jacobino stay uh, for the meeting? Um, does anyone from the council have any objections to inviting her into executive session? We as a council have the right to invite anyone into executive session with us. But if if there is no um, uh, objections, then I will take that as a friendly suggestion the council. Any suggestions, any objections from the council? 
All right, seeing none, I, I, I don't have a problem as chair inviting Shannon into uh, the meeting. Um, and actually that might keep the team session open too for us. <laughs> that actually is a double, <laughs> double bonus for us, so thank you. Um, so I guess at this point, I would entertain a motion to um, go into, a, a, uh, to, to suspend the rules to add an agenda item called executive session to our agenda for April 21st, 2022. Uh, for the last item on our agenda, is there a motion to uh, suspend the rules and add an agenda item for executive session? And the oh, purpose so of discuss, and the purpose of executive session is to discuss the, uh, uh, I guess, the abuse and neglect investigation process for DDS. And is that broad enough to cover what we wanted to discuss? I believe so. I think is so there a motion? Moved. So moved by Karen. Is there a second for that motion? Second. Second. Patty. Seconded by Adrian. I saw Adrian's hand go up so that we have suspended the rules and we've added an item on a, our agenda for executive session uh, specifically to discuss investigations or abuse and neglect investigation policies or procedures. Um, is there a motion to go into executive session at 5.55 p.m.? So moved. So moved. Karen. I heard Adrian move it. I heard Karen second it. Is there any other further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Chair votes aye. We are in executive session. I want to thank Kevin Bronson and Joe for joining us. I know the commissioner did, uh, left us, and just for the public record, we don't believe any votes will be taken in executive session, and we have invited Shannon Giacobino to join us in executive session per the council's uh, wishes. So thank you, everyone, and we'll give them a moment to uh, say good night to us. Hi, everyone. Thank hey. you. Thanks. And just once, and if it doesn't stop recording, uh, we will edit the um, the we'll edit it before it gets posted. Just to be aware, to okay. take out an executive set. If for some reason it doesn't end when we both leave, so okay, yeah, I see All the right. red dot up there, so I'm I'm assuming. Yeah, I don't know how to I don't know how to stop it. So. I don't, Shannon. If you have any, uh, but I as I don't. Presenter. Anyways, okay, I, it will get deleted. So okay, it, okay. yeah. All right, bye. Thank you. Ha, <laughs>